Hello there guys and welcome to another one of my reviews. Today, as you already noticed, we are driving the Range Rover Velar. I would say the brand new Range Rover Velar, but this is actually the pre-facelift model um, because it has an engine that's no longer available. But I'm going to talk about that later on. So what is the Range Rover Velar? Well, when the car was introduced, Range Rover said it's meant to fill the gap between the Range Rover and the Evoque. So this is it. Um, looking at the automotive landscape today, where every car maker is making SUVs of different shapes and sizes, this was a rational move from Range Rover. This was meant to be made. Um, it was no surprise to anyone whatsoever. And I actually love the Velar a lot. Uh, it fills the gap between those two cars perfectly. And I'm talking about this gap because I know you're gonna say, yo, look, there's the Defender, there's the Discovery, there's the Discovery Sport in the range, yes. But all those cars are mainly aimed at people who are actually going to take them off-roading. When it comes to the Range Rover range, um, the Velar, the Range Rover and the Evoque are those cars that will be 99% of the time be used around town. The rest of the range is for people who are actually going to use their off-roading pedigree. It's not gonna be the case for the Velar. Um, and you can tell that by the way it looks. Um, so you'll notice some familiar shapes from the rest of the Range Rover lineup. You'll notice the headlights have a DRL system that looks very similar to the one found on the Range Rover. Uh, you'll notice the massive grille up front and the massive grille down below. Now, I should point out that this car has the R-Dynamic uh, package on which means it comes with these extra grills on the sides and in this case they are done in um, a sort of copper color that looks really nice and that accent color can be found on these fake vents and on the sides on the doors and the front fenders they look really 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 good uh, and I especially like the way this car looks from the sides it's a long car it's 4.8 meters in length and um, it has a teardrop shape, if you will. Looks really streamlined, really aggressive. I love it. Some people would call it an SUV coupe model, but I don't uh, because once you step inside, you notice just how much room you have. And that's the shape of the car doesn't really inspire an, a coupe line because the, the roof line should be going a lot more downwards. But you have this raising belt on the side and this lowering roof line that do create this um, impression that the car might be, you know, compared to a coupe model. The fact that the A pillar and the C pillar are done in glossy black creates this impression that the roof is actually floating. The moment you step inside the Range Rover Velar, you can't but be impressed by the build quality and the perceived quality inside this car. Now, I know some people have been saying that the fit and finish isn't up to par with its German rivals, but I beg to differ. I mean, I absolutely love the way it looks and I love the way it feels. We have leather on half of the dashboard and the other half is made with soft touch plastic. Um, we have leather on the seats, leather on the doors. You have an aluminum brushed trim over here that completes the atmosphere inside this car and it feels really premium. There's plenty of space, good visibility all around, and the steering wheel is absolutely marvelous with this black and white finish and this perforated leather inside. I, I even love these huge buttons, even though they're not perfect in the way they work, I love the way they feel and they look. And this car feels very, very premium. And I think it's above the BMW X4 or the Mercedes uh, GLC Coupe, which are the sort of the rivals of this car because in terms of size the Velar fits uh, in between the X4 and the X6 so it's a bit bigger than the X4 uh, but a bit smaller than the X6 um, and the pricing reflects that too um, being cheaper than the X6 but I'm going to talk about that later on I love the way they integrated the screen into the dash and you can actually adjust its tilt uh, depending on your personal preference. One mention here though, if you adjust it to sit flush with the dashboard, you might get a lot of reflections in it and it might make it hard to read. Uh, the infotainment system works great. 
it's easy to use. The sub menus might be a bit complicated at first until you get used to it. But overall, I think it's a great system. And you also get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and they are both displayed across this entire screen, which is yet another plus. And that, you know what, uh, um, eliminates any kind of doubt you might have about the functionality of the infotainment system. Uh, now, this panel over here allows you to adjust other parameters of the car. From the uh, driving mode, you have dynamic eco mode and comfort to the off-roading modes. And this car will be quite potent off-road, even though a lot of people won't actually take it off-road. On six-cylinder models, you also get an air suspension as standard. And you can adjust the height of the car using these buttons here. You also have a couple of shortcuts on the top of the screen that get you into climate, uh, the climate control zone or um, controls related to the seats, turning the heating on or off and the ventilation as well. And you also have a settings uh, shortcut for various settings. Uh, but overall, it feels and uh, looks absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, this glossy black might attract a lot of dust and fingerprints over the long term, but it's not a big issue. A big issue might be this uh, gear selector that um, takes a while to pop up, and until it's not completely up, you cannot change the direction of the car. So if you're in a hurry and you're starting the car, um, you might have to wait a bit for this whole button to do its, uh, its thing. Um, in the back, you have a decent amount of room. I fit uh, with the driver's seat, adjusted in my driving position, in my preferred driving position. I'm six feet tall and about 250 pounds. Uh, and if I sit in the back right behind me, I also have room for my knees and my head. So that's something um, that's also welcome. Uh, the material then fit and finish in the back is just as good uh, as it is in the front. Uh, one mention I have to make is the fact that the belt line going upwards towards the back and the sloping roof line do cut into the windows into the back. So you might have a um, claustrophobic feeling at times, but it's really not that bad. Um, but let's talk about the technical side of things. So as I said, the Velar was launched initially uh, in 2017 and up until late 2020, it had uh, two liter and three liter engines in the lineup as well as a V8 but the 3-liter engines were V6s. Now, everything changed at the end of 2020 when we got those V6 engines replaced with the new generation straight six mils that we've been hearing a lot about. And I've actually reviewed one of those um, on the uh, Defender. So the new Velar comes with um, straight sixes under the hood and with two liter uh, petrol engines. But there is one notable engine missing, and it's the one we're driving today. This is a pre-facelift model, and it's a P300S. That means under the hood, we have a two liter four cylinder petrol engine, good for 300 horsepower and 500 Newton meters of torque. This engine has been taken out and replaced by a P400E. That's a plug-in hybrid version of the Velar, and it has 404 horsepower uh, these days. But I'm gonna talk about this engine uh, because I actually liked it. Um, I don't think it's the perfect choice for this car, but it's not a bad choice either. You have 300 horsepower, 500 Newton meters of torque. You'll do 100 kilometers an hour in six seconds flat. So it's not a slow car. Uh, the gearbox is an eight speed from a ZF and you get this throughout the range and it does its job marvelously. One thing I will notice uh, and I will men mention is the fact that it feels a bit too sensitive in the first two or three gears. Um, you have to be really careful with your throttle input. And I also don't like the fact that this car comes uh, or doesn't come with an auto hold function, uh, which is annoying. You have to keep your foot on the brake pedal whenever you're in standstill traffic and it gets annoying over time. I mean, this is auto hold is a premium feature and it should be included on a car like the Velar and any other Range Rover as a matter of fact. But that's a topic for a different um, discussion. So uh, the engine um, doesn't really make, its, ma make itself heard into the cabin that much. The sound insulation is actually pretty decent on the car, even at higher speeds. You only get to hear the engine when you really rev it up. Uh, and you might find yourself doing that quite a lot because even though it has 300 horsepower, to get access to those 300 horsepower, you have to rev this engine. Uh, and that in turn 
brings about um, the fuel consumption issue. Uh, now, this car is rather thirsty. I haven't seen a fuel consumption figure under 15 liters per 100 kilometers covered ever during my time with it. So, um, even though it has a two liter engine, it's not going to be very fuel efficient. Now, I have a gut feeling that a three liter diesel or a three liter petrol engine might be just as efficient. Uh, they will sip just roughly the same amount of fuel for uh, similar driving characteristics. So you might be better off with a straight six under the hood because this car looks brilliant, feels great, and you deserve to have a refined engine uh, under the hood. Don't get me wrong, the two liter is decent. It's not unrefined. The only time you will feel the fact that it's a four cylinder, not a six cylinder, is in heavy traffic whenever the start stop system kicks in. And uh, when you're standing still and the engine st simply starts, you might feel a bit of a judder. Uh, and that tells you that, you know what, this isn't a straight six, this is a two liter. Uh, you might want to keep that in mind. But you know what, it's not a big issue. So if you want to get the plug-in hybrid, if you can charge the car wherever you um, daily or at least a couple of times a week, that actually might be a good choice. Other than that, go for a straight six, you won't be uh, sorry. The car is quite comfortable too. As I said, the straight sixes get uh, air suspension as standard. Uh, this car has the R dynamic package as well, which makes it a bit stiffer. But overall, I would say it's comfortable. Some of that comfort goes out the window because of the seats. The seats are rather stiff, both up front and in the back. So um, they do take away some of the comfort this car is supposed to offer. But overall, it's not a bad riding vehicle. The suspension is um, supple. It's very well sound insulated. Not a lot of noise makes its way into the cabin, even on over bigger potholes and um, stuff like that. So the car is well planted. It can handle all sorts of um, uh, driving scenarios and all sorts of surfaces. And I am pretty sure that this is the best off-roading, the most capable off-roader in the segment today. Uh, I'm pretty confident it will do better than the X4 and the uh, GLC Coupe in any kind of off-roading test you might suggest this car too. I didn't take it off-road, but I am pretty confident in its abilities. After all, it's a Range Rover, and that's what they know how uh, to do. So, what's the takeaway? Well, this tester, tester this car, the P300, uh, with the R Dynamic uh, package and a couple of options, is 72,000 euros. And I think that's a really good price for a car that looks this good, drives this good, and feels this good, feels premium in every um, respect. So I think the pricing of this car, depending on the country you're watching this from, might make or break it. Um, at 72,000 euros, the price tag this car has, uh, I think it's a very good choice and I would take it over the X4 or the GLC Coupe. Uh, and I have to admit it's mainly because of its design both on the outside on, and on the inside. It looks absolutely marvelous, and uh, I would love to have one of these daily. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed my review. It's, bit, it's been a bit unorthodox, but that's that. Um, so if you did, just hit me with a like, hit me with a subscribe to uh, keep this channel alive. Until next time, don't forget to feed your passions. Ciao.